basics, we are talking about sorry, the very first week we talked about, we spoke about prayer and what is prayer and how to really pray and how to approach prayer because sometimes you might feel that you spiritually are just not connecting to God and there's maybe there's some type of mindset that needs to be adjusted in your mind and your heart as you're approaching God. We spoke about that week one. Last week we spoke about the different prayers that God rejects. God rejects them. It's not, not a very fun, loving type of topic. But we want to find out why it is that sometimes I feel like my prayers aren't being answered. We talked about the different things that the Word of God says that the Lord Himself turns away His face from. Not to make us feel guilty or to feel ashamed, but to correct ourselves and to adjust our lives. And today, as we go back to the basics, we want to talk about reading the Bible and how to read the Bible. Because the Word of God, the Word of God should be like everything to your spiritual life. All of the saints, all of the church fathers, the life of the church is built on the Word of God. Our liturgies, every line within the liturgy, believe it or not, is coming from some place within Scripture, okay? And so the Word of God, even when we worship, we offer the Word of God back to God. And there's a lot of people that might be intimidated by the Bible. You read the Bible, you feel like, Maybe you don't understand it or um, you just don't get anything out of it. It's kind of sometimes maybe the, the names throw you off and things make you discouraged. But I hope that we can reaffirm our responsibility and our desperate need for the Word of God. The Word of God, the Bible describes it, is like our daily manna. You know, in the time of Israel, when they were in the wilderness of Egypt, they obviously had no food in the wilderness, so God sent them manna from heaven that they would eat it. The manna was not just to be eaten like physical food, but the manna is also to be reflected on as the Word of God. And you know that God would send just enough every day for the people to gather and to eat. And if you tried to get extra, any extra that you would have gathered would have what? It would have rotted or spoiled. Why? Because what God is trying to teach us is that the Word of God has its sufficiency for the day. That God has a message for you and God has power and He has life that He is breathing into you through His Word every day. It is not meant to be like stored up for the next day because God has a message for you tomorrow as well. And so God is teaching us that as we are in the wilderness of life that we are feeding on the Word of God. The Word of God is so powerful. I'll tell you a story from from the Desert Fathers of... There's also room up here in the front. We can clear up these chairs. The, The Desert Fathers tells us a story about a monk who went to his elder and said, Father, I try to read the Bible and I just don't understand. I don't get anything out of it. He says, okay, I want you to take this this, uh, weaved basket uh, or bucket and I want you to go and I want you to fill it with water. So he would go and fill it with water and bring it back to his father. It came back empty. He says, okay, I want you to go fill it again. So he took this weaved basket, poured water into it. Water is leaking through it. And so he comes and says, Father, I did what you said. It's not working. He says, okay, I want you to do it every day for a period of time. And he started to do that. He said, Father, I'm going crazy. Every day you ask me and I obediently put the water in this weaved basket, hoping that I could bring you back some water, but it never stays. He says, okay, I'm not getting anything out of this. He says, I want you to look inside of the bucket. And he looks inside the weave basket. He says, what do you see? He says, I see it very clean. He says, that is exactly what the Word of God is doing. Even when you don't understand it, the Word of God is cleansing you. What do we say in the the gospel of the third hour when Christ is speaking the Beatitudes? He says, you are already clean because of what? The Word which I have spoken to you. Many of us, we have all kinds of things within the heart. I want you to understand, your whole spiritual life is contained in the heart. Everything you do comes from your heart. That's why the Bible tells you, out of the abundance of the the heart, the mouth speaks. So what is in your heart is what is coming out of you. You may not like what is coming out of you often. You might find that, you know, I have angry words, I have gossip, I have, you know, um, like... 
gossip or, or, or cursing or whatever it may be, things that I don't want to be coming out of. You know why? It's because the heart is not clean. The heart is not clean. And the Word of God is there to cleanse the heart. You see, there are challenges to reading the Word of God. And we're going to talk a little bit about going back to the Word of God. You see, the Bible is different from all other books. Other books are written by man, but the Bible tells us that all Scripture is inspired by God Himself. It is written by the Holy Spirit. That the prayers in there, when you pray them, they are not just nice prayers. They are God-written prayers, the Psalms. If you and I want to become saints, we read those Psalms that were authored by David, but inspired by the Holy Spirit. And there's many purposes for the Word of God. And I want you guys to, to listen to some of these verses. In John chapter 14, verse 23... It says this, Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. I want you to look at at the text. Sometimes we read these verses and say, okay, it's a nice verse about the Bible. Look at it. Examine it with me. Look at the text. Look at the words right now on the screen and try to understand it. What does he say? Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. So what is the word of God supposed to do? What is the word of God supposed to do that he says, if you keep his word, my father will love him and will come to him and make our home with him. So what is it supposed to be doing? The word of God is there to prepare the heart to receive God. And this is, I think, where a lot of us feel disconnected from God, is that your heart isn't prepared. You are not trying to make yourself a vessel for God, cleansing yourself from within, asking yourself, how can I make God find rest within me? Here Jesus tells us, it's through the word of God. My Father will love you if you love his word and you prepare your heart to receive God. And you know that when God is dwelling inside of you, it says that we will what? Make our home with Him. We will make our home that God will find His resting place within you. What will you become if God Himself is at rest in you? That when you see so many people, they might have very few words, they might have very, you know, little knowledge, or very simple people, but because God has made His home within that person, they are just oozing the grace of God. They are just a a source of blessing to all of those around you. I want to ask you, how much time do you spend in the Word of God? What what do you do with the Word of God? I'll tell you a story. I love to read the stories of Chinese missionaries in general, but specifically Chinese missionaries because the Word of God is not welcome in China. And so what would happen is that they would find these people, these like hidden villages of people that were like, they would find, they would have like one chapter of the Bible. They would break, they had one Bible in like the span of hundreds of miles. And everybody would get a book for like a month. So one village, they got the Gospel of Matthew. And one person, he said, please, I know that I'm going to get the Gospel of Matthew. You're going to give me the Gospel of Matthew for a week. I cannot wait. And he began to fast and pray for the receiving that the gospel of Matthew would just be in his home. And what did he do? He memorized all 28 chapters of the gospel of Matthew to the point where he took in the whole gospel and he would start going to villages. Nobody taught him. He doesn't have any uh, church fathers or any um, seminary courses. All he had was the word of God. And he would go from village to village just reciting the Gospel of Matthew, just saying it verse by verse. And full villages in China were coming to Christ. How powerful is the Word of God? Another story. Maybe you've seen this video on YouTube. It's a story of, there was like a terrorist kind of camp group. It seems like they were in in Egypt. The, The video doesn't say where they were, but it seems like it was in Egypt. And they kind of meeting in the desert and they were all planning how they were going to make an attack against the Christians. 
and they're discussing, we're going to, you know, do we have like all of our weapons? We're going to do all these things. And they said, guys, you're going to do what? You're going to hurt 10 people, 15 people, 30 people? I said, that's not going to work. Let's take their book. Let's find every mistake. Let's just destroy it, rip it into shreds, read every word, that, find everything that is wrong with it. This word of God that they say is the word of God is, is so corrupt and it's so, let's just take it and teach the people all the discrepancies that are in it. And so they said, you know what, forget the terrorist attacks, let's take Bibles and let's read them. They, they found one of their leaders, he's a very, very bright man, very intelligent man. They said, you know what, you're very smart, we want you to take the Bible and start first. He says, no, no, no I'm not going to take that book, I don't want it in my house. They said, please, it's nothing, this book is nothing. Just go take it and, 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 and read it and find all the mistakes, let's study it deeply. Finally, they convince him, he takes the Bible to his home, he begins to read it. After three months, it brought him down to his knees and said, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Just by reading the Bible. Reading the Bible brought him to his knees. This terrorist of a person, right? He just read the Word of God. And he could have no other answer than, this is the living Word of God. But for us, we read it, I don't get these names, and we don't have the patience to get through the names. We're in a, I think we're in a highly advanced society where people read and you read articles online every day. When it came to the coronavirus, everybody had read 10,000 articles about everything that has to do with anything about the coronavirus. Everybody became an epidemiologist. Like everybody knows everything about viruses. Your brain can understand everything about the coronavirus, but when we read the Word of God, are we mature enough to go and to hunt and to find commentaries and to study? You say, but a lot of people do that, and you're right. The church, the Word of God, was given to us by the church. The church is first before the Word of God, right? It was the church that wrote the Word of God. And we understand the church through the life of the church. And that's why, as well, if you want the Word of God to take place within you and to make your heart ready, it comes from a life within the church through its praises, through its worship, through its understanding and its sacraments and its rituals, these words have so much more meaning. I was recently speaking to some Western Christians who, when they read certain parts within the book, uh, within the Bible, they, it doesn't have any context to maybe how they approach Christianity. And so one person was saying, yeah, I'm reading Revelation. There's things I don't understand. Like there's a part that says, and there was an angel standing at the altar with a golden censer full of incense, which are the prayers of his saints, offering incense before the throne of God. What is that? And like we see it every day in our church. There's an angel, the, the bishop or the priest, standing at the altar with a golden censer full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints, in which all of us commune before the throne of God. And we lift up all of our prayers together in the altar as one. The Word of God is meant to be understood through the life of the church. So if you are not an avid church grower or, you, goer, or you don't really enjoy the church, I guarantee you don't enjoy the Bible either because the Bible is going to have confusion to you. Things won't make sense unless you're living the life of the church. So we said the first thing is that it prepares the heart. God prepares our, he commands us to prepare our hearts for his coming. Psalm 57 verse 7 says, my heart is ready, O God, my heart is ready. So as you are preparing for the second coming, we should be preparing for his first coming, right? In, in taking, letting his incarnation take place through the word of God in your heart. That God would find his dwelling within you through the word of God. And you should be eating the word of God. There's two ways of reading the Bible. The first one is trying to subject the meaning to your own understanding. Fitting the words of God and trying to make it fit in this square. And some things don't fit and so it creates confusion. In order to understand the Bible, there's a nice saying that I read, in order to understand the Bible, you need to what? Stand under the Bible. What does that mean? The word of God is the authority. Our goal is not to criticize the word of God and try to make it fit within my limited mind. That... That is the first way where people try to do it and they're trying to investigate it and try to make things work out in their mind, trying to find answers for things. When we read the Word of God, we stand under the Word of God. And whatever the Word of God tells me, 
I submit to its meaning. Setting the text of the Word of God as a judge over us. So many of us, as we discuss and we... Everyone has a point of view about something and how, how we should live our lives and how we should run our countries and how we should do... The Word of God answers everything. And I find so many people, as they give advice to one another, they give advice to another from your experience. How old are you? You're, you're 22 years old and you are just shedding the, the, the wisdom of, of five years of adulthood before others and that's it. You have found the answer to life. If you want to find friends that give you wisdom, they should be people that are filled with the Word of God. The people, when they're discussing, they say, let me read to you what the Word of God says. That this is the ultimate authority of my life. Young people, as you are choosing spouses, you don't want some know-it-all. You want somebody that stands under the Word of God, that when he or she is going to be leading this home or raising your children or doing whatever, that the Word of God is flowing out of their mind, out of their, their mouth and their hearts. Why? Because they are filled with the Word of God. This is the inspired Word of God. So it's possible, though, to be reading the Word of God. We're going to read a passage from the book of Numbers. Is it a little warm in here or is it just me? Can somebody text Uncle Amin and tell me? Okay. Numbers chapter 23. There's a person whose name was Balaam. Balaam is a man who is described as one who is filled with the word of God and has knowledge and understanding. Actually, it says in Numbers 24, 15, and 16, just to, for, the sake of, for the sake of time. Listen to what it says about this person. And now indeed I'm going to my people. Come, I will advise you what this people will do to your people in the latter days. So he took up his oracle and said, The utterance of Balaam, the son of Beor, the utterance of the man whose eyes are opened, the utterance of him who hears the words of God and has the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty, who falls down with eyes wide open. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. What's going on here? Balaam was a false prophet. He was a man that knew the word of God. He had the knowledge of the word of God. But there was a king named Balak who had hired Balaam to come and to curse the people of Israel. To put a curse on them. And so he said, okay. They made a deal. Fine, let's do it. And then God spoke to him and says, you are not to, re to rebuke the pe people of Israel or to curse the people of Israel. You are to bless them. And then Balak's like, hey man, that's not what we agreed because he had to bless the people of Israel. But Balaam ended up becoming this false prophet, using the word of God to like benefit him in his own personal ways. There is a danger that you are filling up your mind and your heart with the word of God up here, but not in here. Why? Because you haven't made the vow to obey what I read. When you read the Bible, do you tell yourself, all right, Lord, what you say? As St. Mary said, she says, let it be to me what? According to your word. Let it be to my life according to your word. And we see the great saints, somebody like St. Anthony, who went and in the liturgy, he heard the gospel being read, if you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions, give to the poor, take up your cross and follow me. And that moment, St. Anthony left all and followed Christ. He was prepared. His heart was ready to obey what God has for your life. If you don't know where you are going and you feel like you are lost, the word of God is to turn you back. The Bible says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. That in every decision, you should go back to the word of God and see where God is leading you. And you should be doing it every day like that manna is. That I'm eating the word of God every day. That I cannot allow one day to go by without me eating the word of God. Those examples that I gave you earlier are people whose lives were completely changed just by reading the Bible even superficially because they were hungry to know God. But Balaam was rejected and he's a terrible, he's like a very scary warning for people who just read the word of God for head knowledge, not to obey. 
I get people that come and they want to debate and they want to sit and, oh, well, what does this verse mean? And they want to, like, it's like a, it's, a, it's a debate type of thing. And I say, until you take it with a simple heart, until you take the word of God with simplicity, lower yourself and say, Lord, what you tell me, I will obey. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. The Bible also says, before you read the Bible or hear the Word of God, you have to look within. When you look at Luke chapter 8, Luke chapter 8, Gospels, for two weeks in a row, Luke chapter 8, Matthew, huh? the sower and the seeds, the sower and the seeds. Luke chapter 8 is this time in which the Lord is trying to tell us about the power of the word of God. And he says, and the farmers come to spread seeds everywhere. And he, and he does some by the wayside and some on thorny soil and some on uh, stony soil and some were on good soil that produced fruit. It's so important. Listen to what he says. A sower went out to sow his seed and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside and it was trampled down and the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on rock as soon as it sprang up. It withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. But others fell on good ground, sprang up, a yielded, yielded a crop a hundredfold. When he had said these things, he cried, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Then his disciples asked him, saying, What does this parable mean? And he said, To you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is given in parables, that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear, and the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. What's this first group of people? This first group of people, the wayside, if you've ever been, anybody ever been to like... Um, Farming land, maybe like anyone go to like Africa, Kenya, and you walk in between cornfields. There's pathways in between different squares of, of, of like farms, right? So you have like a big patch of, of, of corn, okay? And then there's a pathway in between. It's called the wayside. And that's the path that everybody walks on, right? You don't walk in between the corn. You walk in between the different patches of, 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 of vegetables that are being planted. And so the wayside becomes hard from the walking of what? people's feet in between those, those farming fields. And so what it's saying is, is that when it's thrown by the wayside, it's saying the word of God will not get deep into your heart, will not produce any fruit in your life because of the opinions of others are just going in and out of your heart. You allow them and, and what they think into your life and into your mind that you can never adjust your life. You can't adjust your life to what the word of God is telling you because you care so much and so many people have access to your mind and to your heart. No, the Bible tells us that you do not want to be allowing the word of God to fall by the wayside. And that wayside is, like I said, those pathways in between, those hard dirt pathways that don't allow the word of God to take root in my life. Maybe you're reading the word of God and you're not changing. First thing is you want to figure out, are you the first one? And then he says this, but the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. Maybe most of us might even be in this category. And these have no root who believe for a while and in time of temptation fall away. He's saying people that are shallow. They don't let the word of God, like they don't soak on the word of God. Their, their interaction with the word of God is so shallow that it sounds nice. Maybe you come here and you heard a nice sermon, it's nice, but it's not taking root. Because I am not allowing, not making room for the word of God in my life. I'm not making the desire to, to obey what I'm going to hear. Verse 14. Now the ones that fell among thorns are those who when they have heard go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity. It's saying people that have so much love of the world the word of God doesn't fit in your life, so it chokes the word of God. Be careful of how much your mind is immersed. Secular music, the TV and news and social media and the opinions of even your, your um, 
your, your parties that you follow, Democrat, Republican, all of these things are forming your mind, and the love of those things have choked even the Word of God. That now you faithfully follow the Republican Party. You faithfully follow the Democratic Party, but you don't faithfully follow the Word of God. The church has, these parties have no room in the church. Why? Because we obey the Word of God, not aligned to, 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 to these parties, right? We align our lives to the Word of God. People who are constantly filled with entertainment and love of pleasure and parties and fashion and the world and the fancy this and the fancy that, the Word of God becomes so choked where somebody like St. Anthony hears the gospel and says, go sell your possessions, give to the poor, sell my possessions, how else am I going to live? We work so hard for these possessions. I can't obey the Word of God. I can't obey the Word of God when the Word of God is, when the world has taken so much place in my heart. That's why the Bible tells us friendship with the world is what? Enmity towards God. You cannot, you cannot follow the word of God and obey it and allow it to change your whole existence if you're a friend with the world. You say, well, that's so close-minded. Well, we're like not in the third century, right? This is 2022. We have to be open-minded. Tell me what, how, how is that open-mindedness working for us? Are we producing saints? Are our children becoming saints? Are our families becoming holy and, and more united and more devoted to the kingdom of God and His service and offering our lives for Him? No, we are so far from it. We are so far from the kingdom of God because of the love of the world. And the good soil, the good soil is the heart. Let's read what the Lord says. But the ones that found the good ground are those who having heard the word of God with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. Meaning they keep the word of God, and they know that the word of God will produce some type of fruit. How? I don't know. It's going to be hard to obey this commandment. Whatever commandment that, is, that, is, that I'm reading and that I'm exposed to, it's going to be hard to obey this. But I have to have faith that it will bring forth fruit. Whoever wants to, so the Bible then says, look at verse 18. Therefore, take heed how you hear. Take heed how you hear the word of God. It's not just hearing the word of God and coming to light in life or doing your, your, your Bible readings at home. It is how you read it. It is that you are humbly saying, Lord, give me the strength to obey. Give me the desire to obey. I'll tell you, the Word of God is so powerful. There are times where in reading the Word of God, I'm reading it, maybe I'm prayerfully reading, but I don't necessarily understand what I'm reading. I promise you, the Holy Spirit brings those passages to life in certain, certain, certain circumstances where the Holy Spirit is trying to teach you, teach me in the moment, that's what you were reading last week. You needed to know it now. And all of a sudden, the Word of God comes to life. You say, oh my gosh, Lord, you're opening up my eyes to something I never knew. Because the Word of God is not just words on a paper. It is alive. The Word of God is alive, and it is a fire. The Bible says the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. Let's read it in Hebrews chapter 4. It's important for you to understand these passages and not read them to highlight them or underline them in your Bibles, but to take them to, the heart, to, to your hearts. It says, Verse 12, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. By the way, the word of God in this passage is not the word of God, the Bible. The word of God is actually capital W, word of God. Like Jesus, the word of God. But your Bible is the word of God incarnate in the form of paper and, 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 and pen and ink this is the Word of God. This is Christ Himself. And this is why in the Orthodox Church, when we take the Bible, what do we do? We kiss it. We bow before it. We offer incense before it. Because it is so, it is Christ Himself. Even in the, in the original ritual, when the bishop comes to read the gospel, he removes his crown in the presence of the Word of God because it is Christ. It is the uttering of Christ's mouth being read as we read the Bible. So take heed how you should hear the gospel. You see, God is trying to tell us that the one who hears with his heart rather than with his ears. I think we need to get back to basics. 
You've been told since you were a little kid, read the Bible. Two things that, read the Bible and pray. Two things that people don't do as much is what? <laughs> read the Bible and pray. I don't know why. If you can find the treasures within, within the Word of God, it's addicting. It is so addicting. Especially when you hear the voice of God speaking through its pages. And there's the danger of the forgetfulness of the Word of God. You find this in James chapter 1. Verse 21 through 24. Listen to what it says. From 21. Therefore lay aside filthiness and overflow wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted Word. It says lay aside all filth. Imagine if you are reading this in your room. On your knees in prayer. You have your Bible open. You've been opening up your heart before the Lord. You're saying, Lord, I want to hear your voice. I want you to speak to me. I want you to lead me. I want you to inspire me. I want you to change me. And you open up and it says, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. You should go and make a plan of how you're going to lay aside all filthiness and wickedness. It's not something to underline. It's something to do. Listen to what it says. And receive the meek, with meekness the implanted word. The word of God is likened to a seed that is planted, which is able to save your souls, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. He's saying be careful. So many people are hearing the word of God. Who is doing the word of God? Who's saying, the Bible says, judge not that you be not judged, so I'm not going to gossip. The Bible says you should not call your brother raka, or which means like a, a stupid or idiot or, or fool, right? Because that person will be worthy of hellfire. So the, the two brothers that are pounding each other every time they get together, and they're wrestling, and they're killing each other, and they're, you're so stupid, you're an idiot. The Bible says you're worthy of hellfire. I had to get my, get my kids, and I said, guys, I have a Bible passage for us to read. And I say, Daniel, read this to Timmy. <laughs> Timmy, read this to Daniel. I say, what does this mean? We're worthy of hellfire if we just take things so lightly. And so let us let the word of God save our souls. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. This is so important. The word of God is a mirror. The word of God is the only honest thing that will tell you who you are. You know, sometimes you, you, you might see somebody in the street or you didn't look in the mirror this morning, like you, you're, you have a satellite coming, your hair is like going crazy and you don't realize that, that you didn't look in the mirror this morning. You're like, oh, I forgot to look in the mirror. Guys might do that more than, than girls. Okay, but they get dressed and they run out the door. But the mirror is to tell you what you are. The word of God is to tell me what is inside of me. Recently, you know, we just hired a new director for our, for our school. And we did um, some time with the teachers, and we sat around. And the first thing, the director, she brought down her Bible, and she sat next to me, and she was ready to hear the Word of God. And they're just getting to know her, and I said, this is why she was hired. Because the Word of God is what's going to lead this woman, which is going to lead our school. It's not some experience of 15 years in the education industry. I don't need that. I need somebody that is led by the Word of God. Husbands and wives... I don't, need, I don't want to hear it from my wife that you're being so stubborn. But the word of God will tell me I'm stubborn. The word of God, when I'm sitting before the word of God, it humbles me and says, all right, you need to go and you need to say sorry. You need to apologize. You need to ask for forgiveness. I don't need my husband to say, say sorry. The word of God tells me to say sorry. Right? It is the word of God and that's what you're looking for in anything in your life when you're choosing a spouse, a friend, you are becoming best friends with somebody. You want somebody that the Word of God is what is changing their heart. The Word of God is what is speaking to them. And the person that rejects the Word of God will never change. The person that refuses the Word of God, nothing you say is going to make a difference in their life. That's dangerous. That's why I... I People say, what's the importance? Yeah, I mean, why does, does somebody have to be like a saint for me to get married? Do I have to marry somebody that's so like active in the service or whatever? I say it's a, it's a better choice, right? To find somebody that loves the word of God because that person is going to be humbled and taught day after day by the word of God. 
but I'm 22, 23 years old. I know everything about the world now, now that I can get married, okay? So let's go, for, go with this. No, 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 no. You're a dum-dum. You're 23 years old. You don't know anything yet, okay? You need the word of God to tell you until the day you die how to function. Not to say 23-year-olds are dum-dums. Even, even 43-year-olds are dum-dums too, okay? We need the word of God to change us. So it says, if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who observes his natural face in a mirror. I need the word of God to be a mirror for my life. Let us go back to the word of God. There's different ways to read the word of God. First thing is just reading for, for knowing the stories, right? There's, there's just reading. There is reading it with quiet time. And that's, again, sitting prayerfully with the word of God allowing the word that you are taking the word of God and you are offering it back in, in prayer. It's not, quiet time isn't just sitting with a view, drinking your coffee while you read the Bible. It's my, my spiritual father, I used to see him, like when I would go into his room, I would find always a pillow in his Bible at five o'clock in the morning. And if we ever had like some early event, I'd go, you know, whatever, we have to go and we're packing the cars. And his Bible is sitting on his pillow. He was reading on his knees. That's quiet time. And that I'm reflecting and meditating on everything, seeing how I will apply his word. That is quiet time. Then there is uh, like meditation, just coming and reflecting and thinking about the different things within the word of God. There is personal study. There are wonderful, wonderful, wonderful resources out there. Anybody have the, the app called Katina? You guys heard of the app called Katina? There's an amazing app out there. It's called Katina. You can pull up any passage and click on a verse that you don't understand and you will get a bunch of quotes of church fathers that will tell you exactly what this verse means. And if you keep going, you'll actually find clips of Bible studies from different fathers within the, 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 the Coptic church that are explaining that verse. So it'll be like Colossians chapter 2, verse 13, minute 8 in sermon, whatever. It'll take you directly to the explanation of that so you can hear the word of God and study the word of God. Get commentaries of the church fathers. Be careful of the commentaries you read, okay? There's a difference between doctrine and meditation. You know, there's other churches, they, they meditate. It's okay to read some of their meditations. But when it comes to how we understand the meanings of the word of God, we read the church fathers. It was nice because I was in this discussion with some some non-Orthodox Christians were talking about different things in the Bible. And I said, oh, what do you think? And I said, it doesn't matter what I think. Because what I think could be wrong, okay? So I said, the way that we as Orthodox Christians discuss the Word of God is we go back as early as possible to the writings of the church fathers. And what they thought about it, so they said, okay, they're asking about communion and Eucharist. And I said, this is not like my denomination versus your denomination. The disciples of the apostles, Ignatius of Antioch and Polycarp of Smyrna are writing about the Eucharist in the writing and they're explaining John chapter 6. They're explaining the beautiful parts of the word of God. So it doesn't matter what Abuna Paul thinks. What did the saints teach us about the word of God? Read the church fathers. So there's quiet time, there's meditation, and there's study. Study the word of God. Get a notebook, get your Bible, get a notebook, and find some comments. Write notes in your Bible, write a notebook. Learn the word of God that as you go, it starts to frame your mind. There's a Greek word called phronima, okay? The word phronima is mind, which talks about the orthodox mindset. Your phronima needs to be shaped. Because if you are just reading anything, and you know that every heresy that took place in the Christian church came from the Bible. People misinterpreted the Bible because their phronima is not right. That's why the life of the church sets my mind and, and that's why, as I read the Word of God, it's coming within my experience of the Orthodox life. Many people have been deceived by funny teachings because they don't have the phronema. They don't have the Orthodox mind from the liturgical life, liturgies and the praises and the vespers and the ekbeya and the hymns. This tells us how we understand the Word of God. So you don't have funny things going. Like, Where would you get that idea from? I don't know. I was just taking my quiet time this morning and I... No. The phronema. You need an orthodox mind to understand the scripture directly. And so we look at the church fathers as we study them. So Katina, Katina, C-A-T-E-N-A, if you want to write it on your phones. C-A-T-E-N-A is a wonderful app that you can just look up the commentaries on any verse that you're looking. Let us dive into the word of God and revive love of his word. Again, so it could take fruit, make, 
bring forth fruit in our lives and that we can glorify God. Glory be to God forever. Amen. Let's stand up.